Thanks for joining me. I'm Anthony Reid from the Geological Survey of South Australia. Today I'm joined by Tom Raimondo, Associate Professor of Geology and Geochemistry and Professorial Lead for UNSA STEM, and Andrew Cunningham, who's the Lecturer in Agile Methodology, Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments. Thanks very much for joining me, both of you. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. So, Andy, could you tell us then what is the difference really between virtual reality and augmented reality? What, what are some of the interesting ways these technologies have been applied that people may not be aware of? Sure. So virtual reality, with virtual reality, you wear a pair of special goggles, which replace the world around you that you see with a computer generated image. And that image might be of a completely fabricated world, or it could be a recreation of a real place, um, such as the Flinders Ranges. And so virtual reality lets you walk around that space and explore that space. And the key word we use for virtual reality is this term immersion. Mm. So the person should be immersed in that space. And we like to say they should feel like they're being there. So they really feel like they're there. Augmented reality is on the other end of the spectrum where we actually put computer graphics within the real world and we make it look like it's really there. And the example that I like to use is the IKEA app. So some of you might be familiar with the IKEA app <laughs> where you can hold up a phone or a tablet yep. Uh, you see an image of your living room, for example, and then a virtual couch is placed on top of that living room. But it looks like it's really there. So you get a sense of space and scale and things like that. Where augmented reality is getting really exciting is with things like the Microsoft HoloLens, which is like a set of glasses that you wear. So instead of holding up your phone or a tablet, you actually see through these pair of glasses and it projects computer graphics into the real world. And that frees up your hands to point at things or, or manipulate things in front of you. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the spectrum of augmented reality and virtual reality. In terms of applying these uh, technologies, some, can you give us a, like a feel for some of the, the range of things that people are using these for? Some things that maybe our particular kind of earth science related audience may not have heard of? Yeah, sure. So I'll take a step back and say uh, we're researchers from the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments, which is the largest concentration of augmented reality and virtual reality researchers in Australia, which is pretty exciting. So there's over, over 100 of us in this one centre. What makes it really exciting, though, is that we're this multidisciplinary team, not just of computer scientists, but of designers, architects um, and artists as well. And so what that means is that when we approach a problem, we don't just focus on the computer science side mm. of things. We also focus on the design and human aspects of those problems to try and figure out, well, where can this technology actually be used to make people's lives better? And one of the great examples I have of that recently is that we recently ran several studies looking at how you can use virtual reality to present a crime scene in a courtroom to a jury so that they can understand what the crime scene looked like and what the space looked like better than they can with photos or with their uh, imagination. I or guess. their imagination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very powerful. Yeah. I can throw to you, Tom. So in terms of the UniSA program, how are you developing the use of virtual and augmented reality? In the earth science space, we've got a couple of different projects that utilize both ends of the spectrum. So both virtual and augmented reality. So the first of those is one that we're running through Project Live, which is learning through immersive virtual environments. You could think of Project Live, I guess, as the, the outreach arm of the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments, if you like. So a way to communicate what we're doing, a way to engage the general public and so on. And the project there is one focused on the World Heritage nomination mm -hmm. for the Flinders Ranges. So we trying to tell the story of the science behind that and the significance of the Flinders for a community audience through the vehicle of a virtual tour. It's a great way to engage people with the process. The formal application itself, as you know, Anthony, being involved in that, it's a very dense, it's a very technical document. It's hard for people to, to really get the words to leap off certainly, the page, of course. Specialist. Uh, all the significance yep. is there, but it is quite specialised, as you say. So the virtual tour is designed to, as Andrew said, immerse people mm. in the Flinders Ranges, mm -hmm. really give them an authentic sense of exactly why that environment is so special. So Absolutely. that's in the outreach space and utilizes mostly virtual reality in order to do that. In the augmented reality space and in the research space, uh, we're working with the Minex CRC mm. uh, to develop an augmented reality toolkit for core logging. So basically taking what is traditionally a very pen and paper type exercise with a few other gadgets, like you might have your laptop, you might have a tablet and, and that's feeding you various bits of information about the geochemistry or the, the petrophysics of the rocks you're looking at, for example. But it's very disconnected from actually the physical observation Absolutely. of the core itself. Absolutely. 
the idea behind this augmented reality tool is the two are then seamlessly integrated. So the graphics, the simulations, the, the visualizations that help you in better interpret your core, feeding you data that's relevant to the logging process is right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. And you can seamlessly flick between that and inspect the, the physical and core it, itself. It, it's a very interactive process, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's deliberately designed. As Andy said, it frees yeah. up your hands. Yeah, you can yeah, do yeah, all yeah. of the things you would traditionally do when you're logging core, but you've got that visualization and projected in front of you aligned with the physical specimen that, that, that you can see with your own eyes, mm. but providing you all of that supplementary mm. information to really speed up and improve the quality of the interpretations that you're making. Excellent. Tom, so in terms of the Flinders Rangers work then, what, why is this such a great place for producing this type of immersive experience? I think the, the, the thing about the Flinders Rangers that as geoscientists we all know and love is that it's got 600 million years of Earth's history and some of the most significant events throughout that period. And there really is never a dull moment, right? As you go through it, that, honestly, that's probably the best way I can describe it. It so, is, it's true. It's, true, it's, it's, so. it's a laugh a minute, right? <laughs> so maybe not for the, the, not laugh, maybe not for the critters, <laughs> critters that are involved. That's right. But, you know, you've got, you've got it laid out for you. Totally, Basically, the story yeah. of Earth's history over that 600 million year period is so well exposed, so well preserved. Mm -hmm. And we want to convey that to people. We want to tell the stories that are, that are written in stone in a way that they've never experienced mm -hmm. them before by making them really tangible, mm -hmm. I think. So that's the advantage, again, of the immersion that you get in virtual reality. Things do become much more tangible, more emotive, I guess, mm. because of that. You really feel like you're there. You really feel like those stories are coming alive for you. So to give you an example, the Ediacaran fauna, of course, they are the, the probably the flagship of the World Heritage nomination itself. We have all seen images of the fossils uh, or their casts preserved mm. on the sandstone beds, for example, but we want to bring that alive in VR by modelling what those fossils would look like in 3D and placing them within an ancient seafloor mm. at Ediacaran times mm -hmm. where you can swim with these critters in the, their natural habitats, basically. And that will really take, take you away from just thinking of it in terms of the, the rocks in which they're currently preserved into actually what this world looked like mm. and immersing you in it in a way that probably has never been done before, mm. and certainly not that I'm aware of. So you go from that to things like the Ackerman impact, for example, this, this catastrophic uh, vol volcanic event, for, uh, sorry, the meteorite impact event, um, and recreating that in 3D and, and giving people a simulation of what that might have looked like, all the way through to uh, the snowball earth, for example, mm. and, and all of these sort of period, these critical periods of Earth's history that followed, immersing the users in things that they may have heard a little bit about, but don't have a full appreciation of exactly what they represent. And like I said, how many of these really important events are, are documented better than anywhere else mm. in the midst of the Flinders Absolutely. Ranges? Absolutely. I guess then it's a great opportunity for accessibility. And this must be one of the key things about these technologies is that everybody or anybody with that, with that device or with an internet connection more or less can access that. For sure. That's for our students at UniSA and mm. for many other earth science departments across the country, that's a huge demand at the moment is creating accessible field trips. We know that field, field work can be quite a, an exclusive undertaking for a lot of people because of all sorts of accessibility issues they may have. Sure. The better we can create authentic equivalents of that field work for people, mm. the more we can open up the best of geology for them and, and really give them a taste of all those things that they may have missed. Uh, because of how tricky it is to get into the field sometimes. Absolutely. Well, I think something that you can also do then is also get people that are overseas experiencing the Flinders and getting them interested in the space, especially during these COVID times when travel is so difficult to definitely, do. Definitely. We can get people overseas engaging with this content. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all see, we all hear about classic World Heritage sites globally, mm -hmm. right? We all wish we had the opportunity to go and see them. Well, you don't need to wish anymore, right? With, with a bit of uh, VR magic. Yep. You can be placed in that environment. You can genuinely feel like you're there and, and get that kind of full sensory experience, sure. I suppose, of what it's yeah. like. So, Tom, you mentioned the MINEX CRC as well. So can you kind of give us a flavor, give us a feel for how you're applying that uh, augmented reality uh, into a kind of a mineral exploration or a core logging or some type of mineral exploration workflow? So that's not something that is another kind of a little device that you have to bring with you, but it's actually part of the workflow. Mm -hmm. what, what's your vision for that? Well, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Anthony, which is about making it seamless and as, and as efficient, as natural as it can be. Yeah. And it's actually that the, the origins of this idea are, are a bit interesting, I guess, in that 
I, I've been someone that's worked in VR for quite some time and in AR. Project Live has been around for seven, eight years. I've kind of been inhabiting that space for quite some time. And I guess I came into it through gaming and mm. all of those kind of uh, parts of VR that people are probably more familiar with. But because of that, I, th I don't think I ever thought of VR as an analytical tool, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's just something interesting. It's just something fun, that's right? kind of nice to visualize things yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I never really thought of it in those terms. Yeah. And it was actually a conversation with Andy and a few of the other guys in IVE where they kind of floated this idea of immersive analytics. Mm. And I think that was the first time I really thought about how you can use the virtual reality space to engage different parts of your brain and to develop new workflows. Mm. And Andy kind of explained it to me in a way that, that kind of demonstrated, I guess, the benefits of VR beyond our traditional desktop kind of environments or the way that we interact with data traditionally. So Andy, I don't know whether you want to talk about how AR and VR workspaces are, are engaging you in a totally different way. Yeah, so I think the the amazing thing about virtual reality is that you've got all this space around you and it, we call it space to think. So rather than being stuck on a little desktop mm, screen or a, small a, a mobile phone, yeah, a small window, exactly. You have this you know, 360 degree area around you to organize your thoughts and arrange your your space. So that's one of the motivators behind this concept of immersive analytics. And the other, the other motivator is this concept of embodiment. So rather than typing in commands into the computer like you might do currently or clicking buttons, you're actually interacting with your data with your hands. So that's one of the two key components of, mm. of immersive analytics. And so looping back to your question of, of where does augmented reality sit in the process, um, the way we think about augmented reality is that it, it doesn't replace any sort of modality you currently have. It doesn't replace your desktop computer. It doesn't replace your mobile phone. These technologies just add, add complementary features to the process and make your lives easier. So where you need information integrated in space, augmented reality is perfect for that. It's better than the mobile phone. It's better than the desktop. So it's complementary. It doesn't replace anything that you currently do. Mm -hmm. But I think that that key point as well, Andy, is then as soon as you do that, as soon as you're using gestures to interact with mm. your data, as soon as you're visualizing it in 360 and in three dimensions as well, your brain is working in a totally different way. Mm. And the way I think you put it to me was that it, it's designed to give you new insights or at least different yep. insights. And I didn't really understand that, but I probably should have, I guess, because when we do VR for engagement, when we produce these things like we've been doing in Project Live, these virtual tours that are designed to, like I said, engage, engage people with yeah. geoscience a bit in, in a different way. That's exactly what they do because of the benefits of being in that mm. immersive VR space. It's amazing how it's, and I see this all the time with people that, that um, experience these virtual tours. If I delivered a virtual tour of some kind with just flat images, like the, the kind of things that we're used to, right? A 16 by nine or a four by three image that everyone's seen. People look at them in a way that they've always done. You put them in a 360 image, mm. you put them in a deep zoom image of some kind, and suddenly they're in control. Mm -hmm. They can move their head, they can look at whatever they want to look like, they can explore the space. And just with that very simple change, they are empowered to get more out of that experience, I guess, and they are using different parts of their brain at the same mm. time. Mm. And I think the analytical workspace is exactly the same. Yep. They are viewing data, they're interacting with it, they're interrogating it in a totally different way. Yep. To what they're used to in their desktop environment and and as andy said it's not to replace it it's not to make it obsolete it's just to give you a totally different mm. and complementary way to access that data and hopefully get something different out of it well i guess the insights that come from you know from from thinking outside literally outside the box yeah yeah for sure that sounds great tom so in terms of the the minix crc uh tool that you that you've all built can you just describe give us a feel for what what, what do you see or how do you use that? What is so it? What's it's a it? tool that's actually got two different modalities, right? So it can be it can be viewed using a HoloLens, which is this kind of glass, a set of glasses that you wear where the, the augmented reality image is projected on top of the glass, or, or as a traditional tablet where you sort of hold the tablet up in front of a drill core sample and it's projecting a visualisation on top of the screen and, and using all the touchscreen capabilities of that. So two different ways that it can be used. And what it in terms of the visualisations that it presents to you, there's a, there's a bunch of different things. It could be something as simple as any downhole data set. So that could be geochemistry, it could be petrophysics, it could be gamma, it could be whatever. Yep. All of that data is physically projected on top of the core that it yeah, relates to yeah, and aligned yeah, with yeah, it. So yeah. as you look at the core, you're no longer having to switch between 
um, yeah, yeah, one, visually inspecting it, it and then looking at your laptop that's to it. find out which portion of the core the data relates yeah. to. It's right there yeah, yeah, yeah. at hand. Which meter am I looking at and yeah, where, where is that... this cordioride or where is this? Uh, where is <laughs> exactly. the sulfide? Am I, where am I supposed to find this? It's right in front of you. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So that's one, just a visualization of those data sets. The other one is kind of a, what we call a magic lens uh, kind of setup. Sounds where, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, where it's almost like a, an interactive visualization window that you hover over uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. the yep. data set. And it's almost like x-ray vision. You know, yep. It might be a hyperspectral data set or any kind of image-based data set mm-hmm. that you want to align with the, the core that it was derived from. And, and and correlate the two one to one. Again, you don't have to switch sounds back magic. to your laptop. I'm just well, trying to think what you know the t- the computational power behind that sounds sounds it just sounds like a black box magic to me. But you, <laughs> this is this is your specialty, right? So yeah, and I think it's also again it comes back to those insights that you can get from mm. using those type of mm. visualizations and and seeing your data in situ. We we say in situ with the actual core sample. I think it's really compelling. Definitely. It is for the reason I think that's really critical here is we're drowning in data, mm. actually. And the, the geological survey is no different, right? All of the, the, the geoscience researchers, we inhabit this space. We're drowning in data, but we don't know what to do with it. Or maybe we do know what to do with it, but it's just so disparate mm. and so hard to align and correlate to things uh, that we're dealing with at hand. That we actually we don't bother, or mm. we we find it too cumbersome well, to actually do yeah, that. I agree, and it's something that's it doesn't you're not necessarily integrating that data as well. You might bite off a little bit of data. I'll work mm. on this bit here, and then I'll if I get time, I'll work on this bit here. But being able to integrate yeah. that and visualize it would be yeah, so the more very powerful. The more we get out of that data, and this is where the VR and AR systems, as Andy said, they they have value adds. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They get yeah. more out of all yeah. of this existing information. Yeah, and forces us, I guess, to make those data sets more interoperable as well so that they do talk to each other. Because as soon as they can do that, mm. the AR and VR systems work beautifully yep. because all of the data can be served to it. It can be visualized. You can compare and contrast all of these different data, um, turn them on and off as you as you see fit to aid your interpretation. And uh, when all of that is is done in a way that it's natural mm. and seamless, you you don't you don't think, well, sure, I could... I could dive into this database or that database, but it's going to take me five or ten minutes, and then I have to do it again. And I don't worry. Okay. And the you know, these not are working. all the roadblocks that are just yeah, going yeah, to yeah. limit you, you, the usefulness of all of those data sets. Totally. We want to just eradicate yep. all of that, so it's where it should be yep. to aid mm. your interpretation. Yeah, yeah, and you can make decisions. And I'm just thinking yeah. about the real time, the, the vision of uh, having you know real time data coming out of a yep. out of a drill hole and being able to have that right there visually as you're looking at the core or as you're looking at the chips, almost as it's coming out of the Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the really interesting thing about the problem space as well from a visualization perspective is that it's it's the trifecta of spatial. So you're really interested in the space and, and how things relate spatially. It's qualitative. So you're applying some qualitative measures and it's also quantitative. And, and you know, that's really exciting from a visualization perspective because it means that you really need human input into mm. that system to actually be able to make insights out of that data. So it's really exciting for us from a visualization perspective. I think it's exciting for us from a, uh, like specifically from the geoscience point of view too, as well, where where this could go. I think you've both painted or given us a, uh, you know, a vision of, you know, the future of drill hole logging. It's never going to be out with the pen and paper. Sometime (laughs) it's going to be much more, you know, much more interactive and immersive. And I really look forward to the day when that's, when that's a, when that's a reality for us all. So fantastic work. Uh, I just want to thank you both for joining me today. It's been a great, great discussion. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony.